And welcome to worship at First United Church of East Syracuse. Um, we're glad you're here, whether you're with us um, physically or whether you're watching us on a social media. Um, we're glad you're here. Also, the new upper rooms are in the narthex, if anybody's interested. And just a reminder that masks are to be worn in the narthex before entering and when leaving the sanctuary. sanctuary. Once you're seated, you may remove your mask if you are comfortable doing so. However, your mask is to be worn when singing unless there is a distance of at least 12 feet between you and another person. Each week as part of our tradition, we light the candles of remembrance and the candles of peace. The candle of remembrance is lit for those in the military and their families, veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. The candle of peace reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, community, nation, and the world. Um, please join me in our call to worship. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. 
for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 75, All the People That on Earth Do Dwell. As everybody knows by now, gospel means good news. What is both good and new about it is the wild claim that Jesus not only tells us that God loves us even in our wickedness and folly and wants us to love each other the same way, but that if we will let him, God himself will bring about his unprecedented transformation of our hearts. With that in mind, let us open our hearts to God and pray for an experience of his transforming love and forgiveness as we join together in our prayer of confession. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have loved too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought to not have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are repentant. According to your promises, declare to the world in Christ Christ. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your name. Christ Jesus, our Good Shepherd.
Feed us with your righteousness and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be whole. Then lead us that it may be with you and with our Creator and filled with your Holy Spirit that we live together in love. Amen. Well, this saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore our sins in his body upon the cross in order that we might be dead to sin and alive to righteousness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please, in whatever way is comfortable and responsible to you, for you, share with one another the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to ask you all a question, and, and for some of us, it's a bit of an unfair question. We were, we were joking before worship started about being what, what it's like to be a preacher's kid, and I know there's more than a few preacher's kids here today. So, uh, so for you preacher's kids, maybe you should uh, not let others answer this question, because my question is this. Think of your favorite pastor of your whole life. And tell, tell the rest of us, what is it about that pastor that makes him or her your favorite? What, what does it take? Maybe this is a better way to put it. What does it take to be a good pastor? Or to use the image that our scripture reading for this morning will dwell with, or the metaphor, I should say. What does it take to be a good shepherd of a flock or of sheep, speaking metaphorically. Any ideas? Someone that you can call day or night if you have an emergency. It better be an emergency. <laughs> so. Ah, okay. Maybe the PKs um, have an insight that the rest of us don't. Uh, what, what can we? What, what does it take to be a good shepherd? What have you learned when you were growing up? Someone that listens. Yeah. In, in a, I'm, I'm sorry. Compassion. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, keep those thing, ideas in mind. And uh, Diane will read a passage from John's Gospel in which Jesus himself talks about what it takes to be a good shepherd of 
his sheep. Scripture reading this morning is from John 10, 11 to 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I, and I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is 381, Savior Like a Shepherd Leads Us. Thank you. 
William Willimon, who is a Methodist pastor. I'm going to be specific about that because we'll get to Presbyterian later on. So anyway, and we're going to throw in a couple of Episcopalians as well. So anyway, William Willimon, Methodist pastor and uh, professor at Duke Divinity School, tells a story about a man who came to him looking for advice on how to be a good shepherd to his flock. And of course, we're speaking metaphorically, just as Jesus was speaking metaphorically in John's Gospel. And Willimon was leading a seminar when this man came to him on effective church leadership. You get the connection, leadership? Okay, right. Anyway, the man came to him. He was a participant in this seminar, and he was a second career pastor, serving in what I would have to say was a challenging situation. He was a large man, as Williman describes him, out of the hills of West Virginia. And he raised his hand in the middle of discussion, and he said, Professor, Professor, you know, I had something happen in worship, the Sunday before I came down here. And I don't know for sure if I handled it right or not. Well, tell us about it, Willimon said. So he did. He said, you see, it was, it was prayer time, and, and I asked the congregation if anyone had any special prayer concerns. One of our women raised her hand and said, yeah, I, I, I got one. I want to pray that, that Mary Jones will stop leading my husband into adultery. And with that, Mary Jones jumped up screaming, you good for nothing, although her label was a little more salty than that. You good for nothing, and the two of them locked into a fight, pulling and jerking each other all over the sanctuary. And if that wasn't bad enough, their husbands got into it too, one ramming the head of the other into the backside of a pew. At that point, Williman confesses, I froze at the lectern. I didn't know how to respond to that question. And what shocked me most, he says, was that this pastor's story was it was not the pastor's story. It was the class's reaction to it. Most of the students there seemed unimpressed. Some nodded as if to say, yeah, that, that happened in my congregation too, just the other month. Apparently, no one found it all that bizarre or odd or unusual. The man continued. So I came down out of the pulpit, and I pulled the two women apart, and I yelled at them, stop it. Sit yourselves back down. Only going to ask that once. You're all acting like that crowd in Corinth that Paul had to deal with. If you people don't settle down and act like Christians, I'm going to knock some heads. And they knew, the pastor said, that I could bust some heads if I wanted to because I was a Marine before the Lord called me into seminary, and I've also done a little professional wrestling in my time. Willimon finally found his voice again at this point. What happened? What happened, he said. Well, they, they quieted down, and, and we went on with worship. And my question, though, Professor, is this was what I did what you would call good pastoral leadership. Was I a good shepherd? Was I a good shepherd? Willimon mumbled something like, sounds good to me, and then dismissed the class and went off to pray, God, help me be a good seminary professor. Well, things probably seem boring around here by comparison. And maybe boring is not so bad, you know? 
Anyway, Willimon confesses that he tells this story because he, he believes it illustrates one part of being a good shepherd, and that is the willingness of a shepherd to be fully present and fully involved in the life of his sheep. To be willing and able to lovingly correct their ways in the raw life situations that sometimes present themselves. And that pastor's way of shepherding seems probably crude to folks like us, says Willimon, who consider ourselves more civilized or at least better educated. But, he concludes, this is his point, it seemed to work for that man who presented himself to me that morning, and it seemed to work for his flock. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. I know my own, and, and they know me. And that could be said about that West Virginia shepherd in Willimon's story. It could also be said about shepherds in general. Listen to this. this uh, a man who grew up on, on a sheep farm in the Midwest, and I don't know whether he was Methodist or Presbyterian or Episcopalian, but he grew up on a sheep farm, and he, and he makes this observation about shepherds and sheep. He said, sheep tend to grow fond of their shepherd. It never ceased to amaze me growing up that I could walk right through a sleeping flock without disturbing a single sheep. On the other hand, a stranger could not so much as step foot in the fold without causing complete pandemonium. You see, he goes on, sheep learn that a cluck of the shepherd's tongue means food, while a two-note whistle from him means time to go home. And Jesus says, in the verses before the ones we read this morning, my sheep hear my voice. And this is what he's pointing to. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. In a sermon entitled, The Shepherd's Flute, Episcopal Priest, see we've done Methodist, now we're doing Episcopalian. Episcopal Priest, Barbara Brown Taylor, says this about the relationship between shepherd and sheep. She says, what makes a shepherd good is that shepherd's willingness to get involved, to risk himself or herself or her perceived sense of who he or she is, to risk that for the, for the life of his flock. And she goes on to emphasize his flock, not someone else's, which he or she gets paid $5 an hour to look after, but his own flock, that is, the one he bought and bred and doctored and protected. In other words, he's interested in that flock in more ways than one. For one thing, she says, his sheep are his livelihood, but also they're like his extended family. They know his voice. They know his touch. They know his walk. If they graze with a thousand other sheep and he calls them, they will separate themselves from the crowd and follow him home. His flute, she says, is the sound of safety, the sound of still waters and green pastures, he knows them by name, by personality, too. There's, for instance, Houdini sheep, she says. Houdini sheep who's always escaping through some hole in the fence. And then there's Pegleg sheep, the one who limps because 
she stepped in a hole when she was young. Or there's bossy sheep who likes nothing better than, than to butt heads. Taylor concludes there is something, something about ownership which creates intimacy. There is no clear picture of what Taylor is talking about, that kind of intimate and devoted relationship between shepherd and sheep, than one portrayed by Presbyterian pastor and preacher, see, Methodist, Episcopal, Presbyterian, United Church, Presbyterian minister John Buchanan uses this illustration to talk about that. He talks about a couple in one of his congregations who began planning for retirement. And they worked together creatively, with great determination, day in and day out, to provide for their youngest child, a young woman then in her late 20s, with Down's syndrome. I think of these parents, he says, searching for exactly the right living arrangements and doing it with infinite patience, investigating, reading, researching, interviewing until just the right group home with the most appropriate oversight could be found. I think of them, he continues, working with public and, and private agencies to secure meaningful employment, work for pay that, that's appropriate, doable, necessary. And when all of this is in place, I think of them addressing the matter of transportation, a simple detail for most of us, but, but for them, perhaps the toughest hurdle of all. They worry about how she will travel daily by herself from home to job and then from job to home again. Most of all, I think of them taking turns, following the bus on which she is a passenger as she makes her way to work on her own, out into the world, and then back again. She is secure, he, he finishes, but unaware how secure she actually is. She doesn't know how close, while she rides that bus, how close one or another of her parents actually is. They are good shepherds. Buchanan insists upon that, and I have to agree. Because I think that experience of, of being safe and secure, of being loved and tenderly cared for like that is, is something that we all need to be more whole human beings. And the intimacy of being known deeply and accepted for who we are as well as for who we are not, it's something we all crave. We seek probably from, from the moment we first draw breath. And if we're lucky, we experience some of this in, in our relationships with our parents and grandparents. And so we're now able to, to give it to our children as we parent them, or grandchildren as we grandparent them. If we're lucky, we experience it there. If we're fortunate, we experience, as, experience aspects of this in our marriages, friendships, communities, churches, work environment. Regardless of that, regardless, we still have, and this morning's passage from Scripture is really about this, we have this image of the Good Shepherd that Jesus offers us. We have, we have what that tells us about the God in whom we live and move and have our being, and we can take some peace and some comfort from that. One more story. 
This one from another Episcopalian, Episcopal priest Robert Horn. And for 25 years since he was ordained, he has served eight different congregations, all in the same diocese. He writes about his experiences in a book entitled Stories, Tales, and a Few Small Lies from a Country Parson. There is, he insists, something special about really small congregations. Something special about the rootedness and about the connections between generations. That long continuing relationship between individuals and extended families. The sharing of histories along with experiences of joy and sorrow, triumph, failure, birth, and death. I see a richness of character, he writes, a definition of personality, a sharper image of community and humanity that is missing in our larger society. For a little more than three years, he continues, I was supply priest for St. Thomas, one of these little congregations. Not long before I left, Anna Chereau, one of the oldest members there, died. And the funeral was set for a Sunday afternoon, just after worship. I went down the hill just after worship to the Noonan Funeral Home and, and made my preparations. And while I waited to begin, I sat in the office there looking out the window and I spotted an old man dressed in jeans and a work shirt. He sat on a bench just outside that window or he paced back and forth in front of it. Didn't see him in the chapel. During the funeral, the burial was to be in Proctor's Cemetery on a hill on the other side of town, the other side of the river, the other side of town. My car was to follow right behind the hearst, and we were about to pull out and head for that hill when someone tapped on the window of my car. It was the old man I'd noticed earlier. I rolled down the window. I want to go up top, he blurted. And I said to him, I'm going to the cemetery. If you would like a ride. I want to go up top. He said it again. Then he opened the door to my car and he climbed in. And we drove through the town, across the bridge, over the river, and we started up the hill toward the cemetery. Turns out he wasn't going to the graveyard at all. He just wanted to visit some friends who lived just outside the gate. When I stopped at the gate to, to let him out, the rest of the funeral procession caught up to us, had to wait and that's when the funeral director was able to catch up to me. That's Jockey Combs, he said. His real name is Albert. He's in his 90s, but when he, wa when he wants to get from place to place, he, he, he just asks for a ride. People give it to him. It struck me, Warren confesses, when he needed a ride, he just asked for it, and he got it. He expected it to be given, and the givers expected to give. I think, concluded Horn, the kingdom of God is something like that. 
Anyway, when I stopped to let Mr. Combs out of my car, he opened the door, he offered me his hand, and he said this. If I never see you again in this world, I'll see you in heaven. And somehow at that time, I felt he knew more about that than I did. Please join me in reciting together this morning's Psalter. Please stand and we'll recite together the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's continue our worship with our gifts and our offerings. We ask you to place your tithes and offerings in the basket in the narthex that you're present in the church. If not, we ask you to mail them to the church at 823 Franklin Park Drive. Great God, forgive our giving in and our giving up instead of giving of ourselves to serve your purposes. Remind us to love those with whom we live, to respect those with whom we disagree, and to listen to those with whom we think we have nothing in common. In the spirit of Christ, we ask it. Amen. Does anybody have any joys or concerns this morning? I have a joy. My friend Jackie Rose had a brain aneurysm in October, and I went to the hospital and they said, she's home, she, she amazed me. When she goes and sits with her niece, she walks 18 steps up. Oh, wow. Good for her. That's I mean, amazing. She's still got a ways to go, but through prayer, it, it just amazes me. That's wonderful. And yeah. thank God. Sure. No. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How does, Diane, how does the sound system work? Do we need to repeat what she says for people I, that... I don't know. Oh. It, it's it picks it up? Okay. Good to know. Good to know. I have um, a joy. I have a joy for this congregation and all the help and support they've given me over the last few months and all the prayers that have helped me get through all this. I just want to thank you all. Thanks for sharing that, Diane. Really appreciate it. It's really important for people to, to know. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would encourage us as well to, uh, uh, to remember in our prayers the uh, families of this week's shooting victims. Last week it was mass shooting. This week, I guess, it's uh, police shooting for... Um, teenage girl and for a middle-aged man. So I encourage us to keep in our prayers those who struggle with that. Um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, as you join me in prayer one more time, if you hear me say, in your mercy, Lord, please respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. A oh, great and wonderful God, we, we praise you for the knowledge that we are meant to be like you. That we are made in your image and commanded to reflect your limitless goodness. Have mercy upon us because we fall so often so short. Hear us, though, as we pray for the fulfillment of your good purposes in us and in all the world. That all the races of our species may learn to live together as sisters and brothers. In your mercy, Lord, that we may recognize and combat in our own society the injustices, the prejudices that we deplore in others. In your mercy, Lord, that we who call ourselves Christian may learn to use to the full the gifts of imagination and compassion and creativity which you give, lest our sharing and living out of gospel truth may fail to connect with where people actually live. In your mercy, God, that the way of love may be evident not only in our wide concerns and general pronouncements as a church, but in the hard particulars of our ordinary personal dealings, morning, noon, and night. In your mercy, Lord, for all of our dear ones, wherever they may be today, all who bear the burdens of pain or grief, all who face difficult decisions, all whose public smile hides private agony, all who slept last night hungry or homeless. In your mercy, God, and hear our prayers, God, for all who seek your blessing on those who are close to their hearts. You know our longing for them. You know also better than we what is really best for each one of us. Give us what you have to give. And and if sometimes our priorities seem wrong way round, then help us to pray not our will, Lord, but yours, and enlighten us in the process. We pray for all who who are astray in this life and who yearn for the seeking and saving love of a reliable shepherd, make it appear that you are their Savior and their Deliverer. 
We pray for all who are trying to give good gifts to those who depend upon them. Gifts of leadership and advice. Gifts of affection and compassion. Deliver them all from the sore temptation to attach strings to charity and try to run the lives of those they would lead and help. Finally, we pray for the household of faith, especially for churches in this area. In all that we do together, help us to be faithful in proclaiming the truth about your love and in what we still do separately, deepen our commitment to the one Lord of us all, that is Jesus whom we call Christ, who taught friends and followers to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our last hymn is in the little book, The Faith We Sing, or Sing We the Faith, or Singing and Faithing. In the midst of new dimensions, in the face of changing ways, will
will go in peace to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And while you're at it, love your neighbor as yourself. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.